Good evening, everyone, and welcome to South Hampstead. In partnership with the United Synagogue, tonight we bring you a very important conversation with two outstanding personalities. I know that our guest is an exceptional journalist, not only from watching him in action, but also from the speed with which he responded to my invitation to join us, latching onto it as if it were a big news story. I thank him for that and hope that this discussion will become a big story in its own kind of way. So let me hand you over to Rabbi Shlomo Levine and BBC's North America editor, John Sopel, coming up after this. Where are you from? Uh, BBC. Okay. Here's another beauty. It's a good line. Impartial, free and fair. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, Mr. President. Just like CNN, right? Um, on the travel ban, uh, we can banter back and forth. On the travel ban, uh, would you accept that that was a good example of the smooth running of government? Yeah, I do. I do. Let me tell you about the travel ban. Wait, 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 wait. I know who, I know who you, you are. Just wait. Just wait. Let me tell, Let you, me tell you about the travel, travel ban. We had, we a, had very a very smooth, smooth rollout roll out of the travel ban. ban. But we, but we had, had a bad court. court. That's, That's the only thing that was wrong with the travel ban. You had, you had Delta, Delta with a, with a massive, a massive problem with their computer system at the airport. airport. You, you had, had some, some people that were put out there brought by very nice buses, buses and they were put out at various locations. locations. Despite that, the only problem that we had is we had a bad court. We had a court that gave us what I consider to be, with great respect, a very bad decision. Very, very bad, bad for the safety and security of our country. Well, there you are. Welcome, John, and good evening to you and to all of you who are uh, joining us wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our program tonight. Uh, and just by the way, before we begin, if any of you would like to ask questions, you have a live chat and you just need to post your question, hopefully during the course of the evening, there'll be an opportunity and time for us to be able to look at some of them. So, uh, John, uh, how did you uh, feel um, being put down by the President of the United States of America? Uh, I, I think if my mother had been alive, she'd have been slightly astonished that I was in the East Room of the White House. Uh, I think she would have been slightly even more surprised that I was asking him a question and absolutely horrified that I was answering back to the leader of the free world. But it seemed necessary at the time because you know, Donald Trump was clearly in feisty form. I had positioned myself where I thought I would be in his eye line and would have a good chance of asking a question. Um, and so it was feisty. And I was determined to be polite, rigorous, push back when he had a go at me. And so I said that the BBC, I thought, was uh, free, fair and, and impartial. That caused me a few problems uh, because I then got about 2,000 emails from people saying, the BBC free? Does that mean I don't have to pay my licence fee? So I said, well, no, that's not exactly what I meant. Uh, but anyway, I, I sort of, so I, that was one problem. But it was when he said, I know who you are. And my kids suddenly texted me and my phone lights up and go, he knows who you are. And I suddenly thought, oh my God, are we going to be thrown out of America at that point to be packing my pieces and uh, moving back to the UK? But you are thrown out of America at the moment, and it must be hugely frustrating for you not to be able to be in the USA at this, at this time. Yeah. What's, stopping you, what's stopping you from traveling? Is it the, uh, the British, the Americans, BA, or someone else? Uh, it's, it's the Americans. Uh, I had to come back for family stuff, and uh, and I'm hoping it might get resolved. Uh, it's being sorted, trying to be sorted out at the moment, but at the moment you can only get back into America if you've got a uh, a green card or a US passport, and I don't have either of those. I've got a visa and I pay my taxes in the US at the moment, so um, I'm hoping this gets sorted out quickly. But it must be very difficult for you to do your job at this point in time, not being on the streets of America? Uh, yes and no. I mean, th th sometimes it's helpful to have distance between what you're witnessing and, the able to th and being able to think clearly about it. I'm also talking to a lot of people who are there and who are living through it, but Broadly speaking, would I rather be in Washington, D.C. right now or London? The answer is Washington, D.C. I'm sure. I'm sure. John, um, I just want to say that ordinarily in conversations of this kind, uh, we'd want to learn a lot more about you and your passion for reporting politics and for journalism and your stellar career um, in BBC. And of course, we'd want to know lots of really, really important things about you and your life. Things like, do you like your gefilte fish with crane? 
or an arch crane, you know, are you a schmaltz herring or a pickled herring man? These are the important, the really important issues of, of life. But um, there's no conditions at the moment, so we can't ask you that question. And in any event, these are hardly ordinary times. So I have a very strong sense that that's not the area that our listeners, our viewers tonight would like to pursue. Uh, there are some really very important and serious issues which affect all of us and which are taking the world um, by storm at this point in time. And those are the ones which we really need to, to look at and address during our conversation tonight. So let me turn immediately to the brutal murder of uh, George Floyd in Minnesota and the worldwide protests that, uh, that it has spawned. And you've been around in the um, United States for a long time. You, you, you know it deeply. Are you surprised by the reaction? Well, let's let's start with starters. Thank you very much for the invitation this evening. And I'm glad we are having this conversation because it is such an important one at such a critical moment in America's history. I'm not surprised by it, uh, but still horrified by it. I moved to America. I've reported from America for a long time, but I moved there permanently in 2014, uh, just after Michael Brown had been killed in Ferguson, Missouri, that two sparked riots that too ended the belief that somehow the election of Barack Obama had ushered in a post-racial society somehow in America. People were ignoring some of the problems that were there. They were still there on the ground and people expected flashpoints to be maybe Miami or Chicago or Los Angeles or New York, but who'd ever heard of Ferguson, Missouri? And that was the flashpoint then. And so this time it is Minneapolis uh, that is the flashpoint. I do think that it is profound. I do think it is something momentous. Uh, we use the language of protests. It feels to me like you've got the rekindling of a movement uh, this time in, des in the desire to tackle racism, in desire to tackle the structural problems uh, in the police force. And it comes at a time when America is going through the equivalent of the 1918 Spanish flu with coronavirus, the 1929 economic collapse with the shutdown of the US economy, and the 1968 disturbances following the death of Martin Luther King as a result of the injustice that everyone has seen with their own eyes over what happened to George Floyd. And so I think there is a particularly toxic mix in America, and I don't think anyone should underestimate or play down just the seriousness of the situation that America finds itself in today. So um, let's just try and understand this. Are, are these issues, these recurring issues, these, these terrible, brutal deaths at the hands of police forces, is this something which is fundamentally wrong with policing in America? Or is the racism that appears to be so endemic in the so many police forces a reflection and an, expre an expression of a wider racial problem in the whole of American society? I think you need to disentangle various different threads there. Is there a problem with policing in America? Yes. A thousand people who were being arrested last year were killed by the police during the course of being arrested. If you do the same figure for Britain, it's three. Same figure for Japan, it's zero. The reason is uh, there are very various layers to it, but one of the reasons is that police, by and large, when they go to arrest someone, are terrified because there are 320 million guns in circulation in the United States of America. So every time they go to stop somebody, there is a fair chance that the person they're trying to arrest will be carrying a gun. And that means that the confrontation is that much more on edge from the very beginning compared to the UK. I think policing in the U US is completely different to policing in the UK where police are unarmed and policing by and large, for the most part, my experience of living in this country is by consent where you try to build a consensus over what is the right way to police our society and there is respect for law and order. Whereas it is much more um, confrontational and it's much more about power uh, in the US than it is in the UK. And is there a problem of racism 
in the police? Is it one or two bad apples or is it something more profound? I think it would be Panglossian, to use a silly word or a big word, to describe it as nothing. There have been so many incidents. There was Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. There was Tamir Rice, an 11-year-old kid who was in a park in Cleveland. You know, I, Eric Garner in a chokehold in New York. I can go on and on and on and list all these incidents where black boys and men have been killed by white police officers. And at some point you have to say, why does this keep happening? Why have I never reported on a black policeman with his neck, with his knee on a white man's neck, keeping it there for eight minutes, 46 seconds. Why? Because it hasn't, doesn't really happen. And the wider society, the issue behind the police forces? The, 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 there is a problem of racism in America. I think it's different to the UK. And I think the problem of racism is awful. And I'm not, I don't seek to say that one is less serious than another. I just think that in the US, it is freighted by so much history that you go to slavery, the Civil War being fought over slavery, the restoration amendments that came in after the Civil War, which seemed to give the black population their own civil rights, their own ability to uh, vote, and then the backlash to that, and then the, you, 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 the Jim Crow era segregation. You know, it wasn't until 1965 that the Civil Rights Act got passed and you had the same voting rights. And even now in America, at the last election, and in this election, I'm sure it will be true as well, you will see measures being taken in Republican areas aimed at voter suppression. Why? It's not because it is racist because we don't want black people to vote. It's because black people tend to vote Democrat and therefore they want to suppress the turnout of black voters. But to the people who are the recipients of this, whether it be voting, whether it being able to vote without your identity papers, all these things, it does look like it is targeted at the black population. And that causes the resentment, the anger, the fury that we have seen on the streets these past 10 days. And look, you know, there are some bad actors who have attached themselves to these protests, whether it be from the left or whether it be from the right, with their own motives to stir up trouble wherever they may see. But anyone who tries to deny the breadth of anguish that there is over this, I've just seen a poll today, 80% of Americans, according to this one poll, saying that they think the country is out of control. These are serious times. But what's really puzzling, John, is uh, for goodness sake, Martin Luther King was assassinated 52 years ago. There has been a long time for America, America to get these issues, to sort them out, to get it right. Uh, we've had presidents like President Obama, the first, you know, black, black American of color, you know, who spoke the right kind of language and wanted to do the right sorts of things. What has happened in America that they just can't sort these issues out? Well, I think that, I mean, let's take Barack Obama as a specific. I think that he was desperate, that he would not be defined just as a black president concerned about black issues. And so for a long period of his presidency, he did not want to talk about race. And, he, and, and, the, and the challenge that he put out to African-American communities was, what's your excuse? I, you know, look, I've done this. I've, I've picked myself up by my bootstraps. I've become America's first African-American president. You know, let's all get on with it. Let's try and let's try and make progress. And I think that's why when the, the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson happened and there was the, the riots there, that was such a shock because it seemed that suddenly you thought, well, maybe things aren't that sorted out in America. I think that where America is so different from the US is that. From the UK. From the UK is that slavery and the aftermath of slavery, where you'd have maybe a you know ten white farmer workers controlling a hundred or a thousand black slaves, there is a feeling among the white population to be frightened of 
the black population and power. It is about power, I think. And I think that the, the way you see the police treating a lot of black suspects in America, not everywhere, it's not universal. There are lots of examples of very good policing and constructive um, community relations. But a lot of it is to do with the power that people still feel that they have over the black population. And that hasn't gone. And that there needs to be far more done in terms of education. There needs to be far more done in terms of opportunity. That you get an awful lot of co corporations talking about talking the talk about how we need to promote more black people to senior positions, more black role models, and it tends to kind of you know it tends to be more talk than walking the walk. And I think that that is a one of the problems that you have uh, in America. I had some friends who came over, American friends who moved to London uh, about three or four years ago, and. And, you know, I was very keen to talk to them about London, which is a city I love. And uh, I said, what's what surprised you since you came to London? And she said to me, there are two things. The first thing is I'm surprised at how many people smoke in London and how you go outside a bar or a restaurant or a pub and you see crowds of people who are smoking. You don't see that in America. And then she hesitated and said, the other thing that and I, sh I hate myself for saying it, I didn't know you got white beggars and white homeless people. Because in the United States, it tends to be the black population that are homeless, that are poor. I live in an area of Washington DC called Georgetown, affluent, lovely, historic, beautiful part of the city that was kind of really built up after the Civil War when, you, you had to build big houses for the civil servants who were going to rebuild America. I, I lived in this wonderful mid 19th century townhouse. Um, and you go there and you think initially, well, this is a multiracial society operating properly. But then you quickly realize that it's African Americans who are emptying your bins, it's African Americans who are driving the buses, it's African Americans who are cleaning the streets. And it is, and there were not. You know, I lived in this lovely street called Dumbarton Street. I didn't meet any black people on my block. And that, that is because I think there is still enormous economic disparity. And, you know, I talked about these three things that are happening at the moment in terms of coronavirus, the economic collapse and what's happened following the death of George Floyd. Every one of those affects the African-American population worse there are more African-Americans dying of coronavirus because they tend to have more pre-existing conditions like hypertension, high blood pressure, asthma, you name it, diabetes, obesity, than the average population. They are more likely to be unemployed as a result of this. And the latest unemployment figures, even though they showed unemployment going down by 2.5%, which was a, a big surprise when Donald Trump held a news conference as a result, among African-Americans, the, the numbers had gone up. And, among, and in the criminal justice system, you are going to be worse treated if you're African-American than if you're white. It sounds, the way you put it, almost hopeless, John. It doesn't sound like there are solutions to this problem because they are so uh, systemic, they're so deeply ingrained. If it's about power, then to change people's attitudes across an entire population is not easily done where do the solutions lie? How do you how do you change this? How do you turn the ship? Well, I think that leave aside some of the violence, and I, I am not making light of the violence. Although there's an interesting conversation to be had. If there had been a small protest, if the death of George Floyd had not been caught on someone's smartphone, would we be having this conversation now? Would the world be having this conversation now? Would everybody look, be looking into their souls and thinking, well, am I somehow racist in the way that I go about my life? And maybe that some of the direct action that has taken place and the anger that has boiled on the streets, not just of Minneapolis, but across America, have had an effect. I, th I don't want to get into a council of despair saying, oh, it's just hopeless. I mean, look at where America was 50, 60 years ago, in the discrimination laws, the segregation of schools, that has changed. But have you have, have we reached the promised land? 
No, not yet. Not by a long chalk. And I think it takes, you know, politicians who are going to step up and talk the language that may be needed to unite around what still needs to be done about the challenges that still lie ahead and the problems that American society still faces. I'm a journalist. I'm not meant to be, you know, I'm not there to change American society. I'm there to report on it. But I think I am there to report on where it falls short. And you still see a lot of examples where a casual racism is sort of tolerated. I just take, as uh, I, I think the optics of Monday night's visit by the president to St. John's Church, which is the church. Yes, well, hang on a second. I want, I want to come back to that in a moment. So let's right. not go there because I just want to come back to a previous point that you've made over here because in your recent AmeriCast podcast with your co-host um, Emily Maitlis, um, you had an American guest on the program, a Republican commentator called Ron Christie. Uh, and he said that what is needed, just to come back to this question of uh, how you fix this, these problems <clears throat> and whether the graph is continuing to point northward, what he said is you need to have an honest conversation on both sides. What needs to be said, in your view, in that conversation in order to make it honest? So I think that you can't just say that one side has got a monopoly of right and the other side has a monopoly of wrong. I think that the people that control the levers of power in the United States need to look at the education system and the opportunities that are afforded to black kids in school and whether there more could be done to, uh, you know, make sure that they are graduating from high school and going to college and seeking out the best jobs. Are there the pathways there? I was talking to a lawyer friend last night who was, you know, who's a British lawyer who was just saying that it was almost a computer algorithm that was stopping young black kids joining this very prestigious golden circle law firm because they insisted on eight GCSEs at A star level. And apparently a lot of the black kids, they do better at A levels, but they were being excluded just by the way they had set the firm up. So there needs to be more honesty there about whether you are providing the, you know, there are the pathways, there is the equal opportunity that uh, people have talked about but have failed to deliver. And I think on the African American community, I'm not, it's not for me to talk about that, but you know, what wrong, the point that Ron Christie was making is that, you know, why is it that so many black kids are growing up in households where the father has gone? There are other issues as well about being sucked into lawlessness or drugs or whatever it happens to be. Um, and, you know, uh, the majority of, of deaths in the same way is true in the UK is it's we're not at most risk from being killed by a black person. A black person is most at risk of being killed by another black person. So there are issues in the community there that need addressing. And it, But before you can address these properly, it seems to me, you have to detoxify some of these issues. And it just feels pretty toxic at the moment. What are the sorts of things that the white population have to look at in, in terms of being honest? I think I said about the are, are, are the, are the white population open genuinely to encouraging black people to take up the best positions at the highest levels. I think it's a challenge that we face in the UK as well. Frankly, I, is the BBC perfect in this regard? Absolutely not. I think that it needs to be in schools, it needs to be in employment, it needs to be across the board, it needs to be in health as well, to make sure that you're getting the, you know, the, that people are living healthily as well in these communities. Um, it's no accident that coronavirus levels are higher among poorer populations when you've got greater density of housing and all the social problems uh, that go with it. Those tend to affect the African-American population in the US far more and the Latino population. So if you're black or brown, you are much more likely to catch coronavirus and potentially get very seriously ill from uh, coronavirus. So it's it's across the board that you can't say there is one element where, well, we've got that, just that engine is ticking over perfectly. And now let's move on to the next one. I think there are problems that uh, infect UK society and US society. But if we get so stuck in identity politics 
um, it becomes very difficult to actually find your way out of that. This kind of toxic environment that you're talking about is very difficult to detoxify when it's all around the identity of the of the black and the white person. <laughs> I'm not a politician, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm not there to talk about, I, I, I just think that if you were, yes, I mean, you know, there are the, the identity politics, you can say some see as self-indulgent and it's it, it's gone too far and it's ignoring the bigger issues in society. I think if you are an African-American in the United States today uh, and you see what is happening and you live with the fear and, you know, even people I know who are, I was talking to a young guy highly educated young african-american talking about these issues he went to a private school went to a boarding school went to a college got a master's but he knows that he cannot be seen walking down the street with a bottle of beer or do anything you know that could encourage suspicion because he would he knows he'll be picked upon he knows he'll be arrested he knows that that could happen to him and i just think that there is a feeling that the 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 George Floyd death has highlighted is that the the scales of justice are not balanced properly and that something fundamental needs to happen and change if we're not going to find ourselves back in this situation in maybe six months time if the copper who had his knee on George Floyd's neck is acquitted and you know you look at uh, conviction rates in America for police officers it is incredibly low and i you know or you're back in three years or four years time when the next grotesque killing takes place just to come back to to police brutality again um i know there have been a number of attempts to to tackle racism in the forces um and with very few exceptions uh, they they have failed and um, there are some um some um, better examples but is it because uh, the problems are so systemic and deeply rooted in human attitudes that they're difficult to change? Or is it sometimes in dealing with these problems, John, that the problem really lies in a, an imperfect and a dysfunctional organizational structure that doesn't provide sufficient clarity between federal and state responsibilities, you know, where do the, the, the real problems lie? At what level? The, the thing you have to understand about America, I was, I was talking to a friend who said, surely the government would want the police force to do X, Y, and Z. And I said, stop. There is no police force. There is, there is nobody sitting in Washington, D.C. who writes an email and sends it to the police forces of America. The policing is very decentralized. One of the things that kind of happened after the Iraq war was that the army suddenly had all this surplus equipment that they didn't know what to do with. So all this stuff that was painted khaki came back from Iraq, got painted dark blue and flogged on secondhand to the police force. So you've got a highly militarized police force that come onto the streets with heavy weaponry like an occupying army. And, you know, last Monday, and I know you're going to come on to the talking about what happened outside St. John's Church, but you had, Let's you talk had about I, I, I wouldn't dream of ever being the sort of person being interviewed who'd try and frame the interview as way those people do on the Today program on Radio 4, uh, those nasty politicians. But, you know, you had the chief of the defence staff walking out onto the street in battle fatigues. Yes. yes. You know, so, the chief of the defence staff in battle fatigues normally. Let's just help our viewers to uh, to uh, to develop the uh, the scene that we're talking about over here. This is a, a bizarre spectacle uh, that uh, America is watching on television. On one side of a split sc split screen, you have the President Trump uh, in in his statement to the nation, declaring that he is the president of law and order, and it's his responsibility to protect the right of peaceful protest and the safety of lives and property. On the other side of the split screen, a, a largely peaceful protest in Lafayette Park, directly opposite the White House, is being broken up by aggressive policing that ultimately leads to violence. It then turns out that the purpose of the police actions was so that the president can walk across to St. John's Church and hold up a Bible that his daughter gave him. He is surrounded 
not only by a gentleman who you've mentioned in a full military uniform, but every single person around him from the government is white. There's not a single black person to be seen. So the question one has to ask an observer like you is, is this a question of an organizational mess up by the White House staff, a president who has lost touch with his nation, or a canny po politician playing to his core constituency? Which of the three or any other? Oh, I think it's, po it's perfectly possible with Donald Trump that it is all three. And let me, and I'll go through your, I'll, I'll go through your various, was it chaos? Total chaos. You, you the, 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 these were people, the, the people that were protesting on that Monday early evening, it was about, about six o'clock, 6.30, when they kind of, the tear gas, the rubber bullets and the stun grenades started to fly. There is a different crowd that was on the streets at night after nightfall than early evening. This was the Waitrose crowd. This was the people who do their shopping. There were church leaders, college lecturers, doctors, health workers. You know, Washington's a pretty professional place. Yeah, black people as well protesting. But this was your Waitrose crowd. And suddenly the, the military force, federal officers are used to clear Lafayette Park, <clears throat> 8th Street and 16th Street. And, um, and you're thinking, what on earth is going on? Why are they doing this? And then the president walks across because he wants to project a tough image. It was done on the hoof at the last minute, orders given late. You could have done that. You could have prepared the whole afternoon to have that got that quietly moved away. But it was done. Crash, bang, wallop. I'm going to show who's in charge. So that's one area where you're absolutely right. Um, how does it look when he's handed a Bible and he holds it awkwardly? He's not there to give a prayer. He's not there to read a passage from the Bible. He's, he's, holding, not, he's not going to say the Shema, is he? He's not going to say the Shema. Uh, and he holds, he holds the uh, Bible up and a reporter shouts, is that your Bible? And the president goes, no, it's a Bible. Just any old Bible I just happened to find. So. The optics of it are terrible, as you say, because it is a group of white people showing who's in charge. Now, is that the message that you want to send uh, at a time when you have got fractured and fraught uh, relationship with the African-American community? And they are feeling very sore, very unhappy and feeling that things are going badly wrong. And the third reason why you may be right uh, in your analysis, which was, is it a canny move? Potentially, because Donald Trump came to power presenting this dystopian picture of lawlessness in the United States, the American carnage he talked about in his inaugural address. At his address in, uh, in Cleveland at the Republican convention in 2016, in the summer of 2016, three months before the election, he talked again about the lawlessness and how it stops and it will stop when I'm president. The law and order message is a good one for, for a Republican. It's what Nixon ran on in 1968. Uh, and so you can see where Trump is coming from on all of that. There was an, you know, we could spend another three hours talking about Trump tweets. There are two that I want to mention very short ones, in block capitals, of course. One said law and order, and he's done that again today. And the other one said silent majority. He believes there is a silent majority that is backing him. The polling evidence that we've had so far suggests otherwise. The polling evidence suggests, for all the tumult, the chaos, the noise, the brouhaha of the Trump presidency, his polling approval ratings is a flat line. It doesn't go like that, as you might expect in normal politics. It's a flat line. It never goes below 40%. It never really goes above 45% in approval ratings. His handling, his handling of this, the approval ratings are down to 33%. That marks a significant erosion in his base that we haven't seen before. Unless he can claw that back, he's got serious difficulties. 
He wanted to run on the strength of the economy. He may not be able to do that now. Let's let's come let's come to to the issue of the election in just a moment. I just want to pursue yeah. some of these points just a little bit further, John, because um, you know I, I understand the, the the point that you made about um, what Ron Christie actually called a perfect storm for for American people of color. Uh, the uh, combination of the coronavirus, the economy, and and uh, the the racism, and and one can well understand that they are, you know, feeling um, very very unsettled indeed. And one would have complete and total sympathy for that. Uh, is there a case on the other on the other side to be made for the other side of this polarized, terribly pol polarized America, uh, the working Americans in the in the Rust Belt? Who have seen their jobs export, ex, exported abroad, a fall in living standards, an opiate a, a, epidemic that that uh, that strikes them and, and their and their children, increased crime, with a perception that black people are uh, are are involved in it more more than whites, squabbling politicians who can't uh, seem to agree on anything, and that this group of people are craving a president uh, who is tough on law and order. The, these are the people who voted for for President Trump. Do they not have an equally legitimate grievance on the other side of the Great Divide? It's it's not for me to weigh weigh the, the, the comparative value of each side's grievances. But you describe is, is is there a legitimate? But you grievance? anatomize. Sorry, Shama, you you anatomize brilliantly the Trump base. That is that is what people that I've met across the country will say repeatedly that Donald Trump speaks for us in a way that no one else has. He gets our problems and he's a fantastic instinctive politician. His gut feel for the, the heartbeat of the nation in 2016 was a million times better than Hillary Clinton's for all the money that she had to spend on qualitative and quantitative polling and all the rest of it, the focus groups and whatever. Donald Trump got it that people felt that they had been left behind, that globalization had done, given them a poor hand and that their jobs were being shipped offshore and their manufacturing jobs and all the rest of it, their steel towns had, had disappeared. Donald Trump gets all of that. And I'm sure that there will be a large section of his base who will be thinking, how can we be sitting by and watching shops burning down and people's livelihoods, whether they are owned by white shopkeepers or black shopkeepers or brown shopkeepers or whatever it happens to be, that people will be resonating to that. And I think that you're going to have a very clear choice come November between people who say, right, here's Joe Biden. I'm Mr. Empathy. I'm Mr. Unity. And you're going to have Donald Trump. Trump, on the other hand, saying, I am Mr. Tough Guy, I am Mr. Law and Order, I will bring, you know, I will stop the chaos on the streets. And I think that America is going to, once again, uh, face a pretty polarised uh, choice between those two distinctive positions. Well, Sherman, just one, let me finish. The, the, the one thing that struck me when I went around America during the 2016 campaign was the number of people who came up to me and said, you know, Donald Trump says what I'm thinking, but I'm not allowed to say, i.e. he is articulating something and in his politically incorrect way of expressing it is giving vent to some of the feelings that people who felt uncomfortable having eight years of an African-American president with Barack Obama now felt they had someone who was a much more reassuring figure. And I tell you what, it is not easy to go around America and find people who say to you, I voted Donald Trump in 2016, I wish I hadn't. Nevertheless, as you pointed out, some of the um, in his handling of the current, uh, the current, current problems, he's, um, um, uh, the numbers are slipping and they're slipping below where they were before. So there must be uh, a certain amount of erosion around around the edges. But, but all that's happened in this last part of our conversation, John, is that the polarization and the gap between the two sides has become wider. Uh, and and the, the fundamental question that all of us who watch America, you know, a sense of this incredible battle going on, this terribly polarized country, is what has to happen in order to bridge the gap between these two very different sides of America? 
<laughs> way above my pay grade. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a huge question. I think that you would have thought that a coronavirus, which is sort of indiscriminating and is sort of there as a, a threat to everybody, would be a source of which people could rally around and think, well, we've got this national crisis. How do we respond to it? Even that has become politicized. Even that has polarized people. Although I think that, I, I, you know, if we're talking about the, how you heal the divisions of American society, I do not know. And I think it's it's not just Donald Trump. I think Donald Trump is partly a manifestation of it. I think social media, I think distrust. I think this, you know, I kind of, I don't, I don't want to talk about my job, but as I think as a journalist, there has never been a more challenging time for me to be doing my job and never a more important time to be doing my job. Because I actually do think that there is such a thing as truth, that facts are sacred, that we do have a duty to report fairly, and that we have a role to play in all of this. I think that, you know, and, and arguably as a rabbi or a religious leader, you have a role to play in all of this. I think that, you know, we, we have seen through history that democracies where there is the rule of law and there are free and fair elections and there is equality below, before the law is a pretty good thing to aim for. And I worry that some of those things are challenged by some of the things that we see in society today. So I kind of think we've all got to, um, you know, I'm going to campaign for journalism that is straight and honest and fair and that, you know, I'm not an enemy of Donald Trump or I'm not an enemy of Boris Johnson or I'm not an enemy of Hillary Clinton or whoever it happens to be. If they had won the election or Angela Merkel or Emmanuel Macron, I've got a job to do, which is to report on what power is doing and hopefully speak truth uh, to power and hold people to account for the decisions they make ask the questions that other people would want, the public would want asked if they were in my position. I think that there, if we could just detoxify some of that, then maybe you can start having a more grown up conversation. But the polarization predates Donald Trump, but arguably it has worsened in the last few years, and not just in America, but whether you're in Brazil or whether you're in Russia or whether you're in Britain or whether you're anywhere in the world, you could look, you can see a rise in populist parties. And and part of this parallel polarization, part of the the the, um, the problem of the pro, of the um, polarization actually lies in in the press itself in America. I mean, the fact that we have here, you know, um, you as a BBC reporter who actually has as part of your creed the responsibility to remain objective and not to put a personal point of view, not to take sides and to ask the right kind of questions. And that doesn't happen in America. Just listen to President Trump when he puts you down. Oh, yes, you know, we know you. You're like CNN, because CNN is going to put one side of the story and Fox News is going to put the other side of the story. And straight away, the people who are going to tune in are going to tune into the program that reflects their views. They will never hear the other side of the of the story, they will never hear objective reporting. They will simply have their own prejudices stoked up. And that's part of the fundamental problem, isn't it? I, I agree with that. I think that I, some of American television just causes my jaw to drop when I've seen the way they cover things. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you go back to, you know, my, my dear colleague, Emily Maitlis has been in hot water uh, of late, and I, I don't want to particularly talk about that, but I'll tell you about a, a, a CNN presenter where Donald Trump had done a speech, he'd done a rally, it was particularly raucous, and it cuts back to him in the studio, and he's sitting there going, man, that man's unhinged. Yeah. I mean, what an embarrassment to have him as our president. This is the news anchor. Now, yeah. if you want to get guests on, yeah. uh, you know, We've got Shlomo Levin, who's going to Levin, who's going to talk about what an idiot Donald Trump is. Shlomo, what did you make of that? And uh, you know, fine, right? But but you don't have the anchor sitting there, acting as judge and jury, because I think that's just completely the wrong side of the line. Yeah, we are there to ask questions, not to tell people what to think. I heard a comment from uh, from an American who's watching our program in, from Portland, Oregon, uh, by the way, where there are very few black people. Um, and she says that uh, until such time as there is, one has changed the economic disparity in America, looking for solutions over here, that when you have uh, two um, black and Hispanic families, when even you know both members of the family are working 24 seven and they can't 
survive on the minimum wages that they've received, you're never going to be able to pull the black and Hispanics out of their economic doldrums and to give them the kind of status that is required to become educated, to be able to take up positions in, in business, in, in academia, etc. This terrible disparity starts with the economy. I, I would agree. I would agree with that, and that's why I was talking about you know <clears throat> the big corporations. Are they really open to taking the actions that are needed to foster the idea that black people can prosper in that organisation, that they can reach the top, that they can become the CEO or the CFO, whatever it happens to be, and that that then acts as a role model for other young black people? And we saw that people started to believe it, it had happened when. You know, in 2008, Barack Obama became the 44th president of the United States of America, but then became more disillusioned as time went on. And that although there was a black person who was leading the country, in corporate America and in so many other spheres, things had changed too little. It is a huge challenge. And I would argue that is a challenge that we face here in Britain just as much as you do in Portland, Oregon or Portland, Dorset. Just uh, on the subject of economy and, and the election, I mean, Bill, Bill Clinton very famously said about presidential elections, it's the economy stupid. Yeah, you don't get that. You don't understand how it all works. You've spoken about the seriousness of this moment uh, from your perspective as a longtime observer of American politics and the social scene. Is this Black Lives Matter movement in your view, a defining moment, a seismic shift in the forthcoming election by which the candidates are going to be judged? Or do you think that like the other killings and protests which followed them, it will, as we get closer to the election, uh, begin to recede and the concerns about jobs and the economy and all the stuff that the president has played upon in his previous uh, presidential um, election uh, will, um, will come to the fore in the aftermath of the coronavirus because it's such a mess. Are those, do we see this now as being the battleground for the election or is it going to come back to the economy? Super. I remain sceptical. I think that Americans, and maybe we all do, in this attention deficit disordered time that we live in where our phones we're looking at and we can't concentrate anything for five minutes, our memories are incredibly short. I, you know, two years ago, or less than two years ago, we were all talking about the Mueller report. Would this be the decisive moment in the presidential election? People can barely remember what the Mueller report was. It was only at the, you know, January, February, that the president was being impeached. And we were saying impeachment. He would become the first president ever to win a second term, having been impeached. Impeachment just seems like that was gone. The Russia investigation, gone. You know, people forget very quickly and move on to the next thing. And so, you know, I, and I'm guilty of this. Uh, the number of stories I have broadcast where I, I kind of sit with, and historians sit with their pens poised tonight to write a new chapter in the American, and then you've forgotten what it was the next week. Um, so I hesitate about that. I think there is something going on, whether it is this epic moment i'm not sure i thought you know i'm going to talk about a different subject now for a moment but gun crime when there was the killing at the marjorie stoneman douglas school in florida and these amazing articulate kids set up this movement that they wanted a ban on assault rifles and that you you know you had to be at least 21 before you could buy a weapon and you thought this is a moment this is and there were the protests in washington and i reported on them and it seemed like wow this Finally, something is going to change on gun law in the US. Nothing has really changed. And I don't know whether this will fizzle out as well. I think that this is more than protest. It is a movement. There will be demands for change. Will it be the seismic change that the protesters, the Black Lives Matter people are demanding? Almost certainly not. But will it move the dial a bit more towards justice, the arc of history, moves towards justice, as Martin Luther King said, it's, po it's possible that this will be another move in the right direction. And though George Floyd has lost his life, that maybe America will move in a better direction. But I wouldn't bet on that. I think that 
in, in 2020, it will come down to who governs, who do you trust to govern? And I think it will, I think there will be elements that go beyond the economy. I think it has been a very noisy period of a Trump. The Trump presidency is noisy. He wants to be center stage the whole time. He wants to be commanding the debate. He is brilliant self-publicist, brilliant at dictating what are the news stories. Do people just think, I want to rest? I wouldn't mind a bit quiet, a quieter period. And I think that Joe Biden might try to think that the, 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 the economy, of course, will be important. But will it be a choice, as I tried to lay out a little while ago, about you know unity, empathy, a calmer America? Or will it be people saying, law and order, we've got to get a grip, we've got to make America great again, and all of that? And I think it's a really interesting question. If, if we had been sitting down having this conversation three months ago, I wouldn't have given a definitive answer because I'm part of the BBC, but I would have sort of given every indication that I think that there was a very strong chance that Donald Trump would be re-elected because the US economy was powering ahead so well. Now, as we sit here today, not so sure. So we shouldn't be going running out to Ladbrokes or Paddy Powers and setting bets because we might just find ourselves coming spectacularly unstuck. I, I, I think there is so much that is unknowable still. Um, I can I can easily make it is remarkable how solid the Trump base is and that gives him a platform to victory but he needs to broaden out if I can just do 30 seconds 45 seconds of sophology uh, of of US voting 2018 in the midterm elections Donald Trump did very badly in the suburbs of America and particularly badly among white college educated women who had voted by a majority 53% voted for Donald Trump in uh, 2016. If he can't get them back, he's got serious problems. And at the moment, the evidence as there is, is that he is struggling to get them back. Now, whether Joe Biden is the ideal candidate to be the foil to Donald Trump is arguable. He looks every bit of his 77 years, whereas Donald Trump, you would say, is still incredibly vigorous and energetic uh, for a 73-year-old. So I think that there are things there that I just, you know, it's, I don't want to do the classic BBC on the one hand, on the other, only time will tell, John Sobel, BBC News, Washington. <laughs> uh, but I'm giving you some kind of, uh, I'm hopefully giving you a sophisticated version of that. And in 2016, Hillary Clinton won a popular majority of 2.9 million votes, but she failed to win the White House. Could uh, Biden win but still lose? Yeah, of course. Look, I, I, I don't buy into poor old Hillary. She got three million more votes. I think that Hillary Clinton, you play by the rules and the rules say you have to get 270 delegates in the Electoral College to win the presidency. And she failed to campaign in Wisconsin. Huge mistake. She took Michigan for granted. Huge mistake. And she didn't put enough resources into Pennsylvania. On that basis, Donald Trump navigated a narrow path to victory, and it showed that he was much cleverer than she was in the run up to that election. So, yeah, it's perfectly possible that Joe Biden will stack up the votes in California. He'll stack up the votes in in uh, New York and on, on the East Coast as well, along the East Coast. But he'll still lose. And that would just be terrible, terrible campaigning on Biden's part if he allows that to happen. Look, John, we can't leave this conversation for which we only have another few minutes without talking for a moment about the United Kingdom. Um, how do you see racism in the United Kingdom? Is it different to the USA? And if it, if it is, does it have different solutions? I think that the racism in the UK, there was not a big, significant black population in the UK until the Windrush generation of post-war and needing people to come from the West Indies to staff the hospitals, to run our buses, to keep the transport networks going. It is not freighted with the same history about power as it is in the US. And I think that makes it very, very different indeed, that there is still a white supremacist element whether expressed implicitly or explicitly. I, mean, I remember a rally that Donald Trump gave where he was railing against 
uh, black American footballers taking a knee uh, during the national anthem. And he said something, he was, a, he was going to address an audience in Alabama. He said, why do people like us have to make, pay money to watch people like them? Well, the us in the room were white and the them were black. And I think that that is um, it's part of America's original sin. I think that we have a problem in the UK of they are others. They are not like us. But it's not with the same history uh, that it is. Although we've got, of course, we've got a history of slavery and we've seen the events that have happened in Bristol today with the toppling of a statue to Colson, you know, who was one of the original slave traders. Yes. So, so there are deep seated problems here. I think that the solutions, though, are mightily similar on both sides. It is about education. It is about health. It is about opportunity. It is about treating our fellow human beings with dignity and respect and not thinking that we are superior. And our history knows about the dangers of that, and we should be just as conscious of it today for other minorities in this country. And uh, Harriet uh, Morris Sloan in our live comments puts it beautifully um, and adds to what you've said, John. It's up to each and every one of us to make a difference, to call things out, to challenge, and to hold people to account and to make sure that there is some change. We don't have to wait for a change in presidency in a country on the other side of the world. Uh, and uh, I endorse those sentiments entirely, as, as, as I believe uh, you do. So um, there are some other comments in, in, in the live comments, but we did uh, say that this would be a, an hour long broadcast. And we uh, want to thank everybody for, for their live comments, which you can take a look at uh, later. Um, John, this has really been a very uh, fascinating and an enlightening conversation. Um, it would have, it would be, would have been a fun conversation if the topic weren't so very, very serious. Um, as Jews uh, and as citizens of the world, we have a responsibility to, to as you have said, to challenge and to address racism where, wherever it arises. Um, and one of the reasons why we have asked you to spend some of your precious time and your expertise talking to us is because the prerequisite to fixing the problem is by trying to understand it. And we are searching to understand more deeply what the nature of the problems are so that we can begin to fix it, notwithstanding that each one of us in our own lives has our own way of fixing it through our own personal interactions that we have every day of the, of the, of the day, of the week. Uh, so the discussion, I think, has taken us a couple of steps further. And I hope that uh, others will, uh, will agree that. Uh, the task now is for us, each of us, to do that which is required of us to remove this curse from society, and that is the task with which we, we leave the, the interview. But for one other thing, and that is that, in as you know, in our previous conversation, we also understood there's a whole other dimension of the discussion that we would have liked to have had, which was simply not appropriate for tonight, uh, and that is in relation to uh, the um, America and, and Israel, which, of course, is a subject of a great great interest to most of the audience who are with us tonight. Uh, and you did very kindly suggest that you might be prepared to come back at a later stage and to talk to us about that as well. Um, so we look forward to that opportunity. And this may this be there for the beginning of our conversations uh, and not, not the last of them. We're very, very grateful to you. John, it's really been just great to, to know you, to get to know you and to talk to you and to have this opportunity. It's just been terrific. Thank you so much. Shlomo, let me just say to, to you and to all of you out there who have been watching to this, thank you very much for taking part. Shlomo, good luck in your community with the work that you're doing and the causes that you say that you you, you all as community leaders uh, need to embrace. But I suspect it comes down to all of us doing our bit and me and Joan looking to try and discuss these issues in a serious way, uh, which... Shlomo, you've given me the most perfect opportunity to do this evening. So thank you very much for having me. And in, and in true BBC uh, fashion, uh, we have to say thank you to our producer, Richard Verba of the United Synagogue, uh, and to Neil Moss for his assistance in this programme as well. So to all of you who have been with us for this last hour, and to John, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to the next occasion.